Gavin Gear here from UltimateReloader.com. I'm here at the 2020 SHOT Show in the totally blue Dillon booth with Steve Dillon himself. Thanks, Steve, for yeah, coming to talk with me. Absolutely. So pretty much everybody that reloads knows the blue equipment, but what a lot of people don't know is how Dillon Arrow and Dillon Precision relate to each other, who Mike Dillon was. Could you tell us a little bit about the okay. company, how it was started, yeah, sure. who Mike was? Okay, so my dad was a uh, pilot. Okay, mm -hmm. he was a pilot for TWA mm -hmm. and uh, co-pilot for like 13 years. In 1978, he just he got involved. Actually, a little bit before then, he had an airplane. Uh, the plane crashed. The guy who owned it uh, had some uh, reloading equipment and a machine gun, and, and my dad wound up with it. You okay. Know, in, in place of his airplane. Sounds so, like a uh, dangerous combo. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting because it's like all these guys like the same things. You know, guys yep. like planes, like the machine guns, and they like the, the ammunition and blowing things up. So, yep, yep. Um, from there, he started loading on the uh, Star Tool, Star Machine, which mm -hmm. maybe some of your uh, listeners will recognize that. It's evidently a really high quality it. machine, but from the 1960s maybe, 1970s? From, it, it, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, he modified that to be able to load 223 for his AR-15, mm -hmm. and then he sold that as a kit. People liked it, and they said, uh, why don't you just build a machine from scratch? We did this in the garage at our house, mm -hmm. starting in around 1977, okay? Mm -hmm. and made these machines out of stainless steel, just, you know, all handmade. Wow. Moved out to the airport, um, got a little cubicle, rented it from uh, Discount Tire. And, really? Uh, yes. Um, they, they owned a, like a strip of uh, little warehouses, you know, yep. with the office door and the, and the garage door. And we took our Bridgeport machine, we took our, our lathe, our chucker from our garage, moved it uh, in, into that facility, and um, from there, we just we we just kept he just kept expanding the product line. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I'm about 13 years old. Okay. And you know, I, I just went wherever you know he was going, and that must have been an interesting you know, childhood. Did, were you were you out there shooting belt fed stuff and having all sorts of crazy experiences with dad? Okay. So like, <laughs> yeah. So in '72, he got his first machine gun. It was a Thompson. Okay. It was a 45. 20, 21 over stamp. That's okay. right. It's the 45. Yep. And he had, and it came with a hundred round magazine, mm -hmm. which is very rare. And it came with the whole, you know, the the case and everything with the, this is a purple crushed velvet lining. <laughs> and it's, it's a very interesting piece. Huh. Anyways, the guy sees it, he's got the hundred round magazine for the Thompson, which they only made a few of them because they didn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And he traded them an Armalite AR-15 for it, okay. which was the origin, one of the original uh, stoner guns yep. um, that was a demonstrator for the AR-15. But that's a full automatic gun because that gun was before they made the M16. Okay. And it's got the decal on the side. It's, it's a historic piece. Wow. So then he, now he's got a 223. And an interesting thing about my dad is that he might have a, a historic piece, right? Okay. But he never treats it that way. He just uses it for what it was originally designed that's for. That's great. And so he would just shoot shoot that gun until you know he would burn up barrels and put in new barrels. And <laughs> Anyway, so. He modified that star reloader, which was only good for pistol rounds. Yeah, right. To load the 223. So that's that's how he got it started. So that's around 1976 that he got the, the AR-15. Okay. Around that time, he got his first British 303 Brownings, okay. um, which were, if you're familiar with that, the AM2 303 British guns, the same guns that were like in the Lancasters and the Spitfires and stuff like that wow. of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And he got um, 10. Maybe 10,000 or so is really interesting ammunition. Smoke, British 303 smoke tracer armor piercing incendiary. Ooh, nice. And uh, I mean, some of it was smoke tracer and some of it was armor piercing incendiary. And yeah. just most amazing um, leftovers from the Second World War. And there's yeah. very little of that left. But he had these two Browning 303 guns <laughs> and he put it into a twin Browning mount, which is the same uh, mount that they use in the back seat of an SVD. Wow. Okay. And uh, it was just a neat arrangement. And then he would, you know, we just shot up all the smoke tracer. And again, there's only a few rounds left, I think, in the world of wow. this stuff. <laughs> and uh, one, one of our guys that works for us, Peter Gorbanko, yeah. uh, he's, a, he's an ammunition expert. Now, we just talking to him the other day. He's a collector, you know, like some people collect stamps. Mm -hmm. He collects ammunition. Now, I was talking to him just the other day. 
about reminiscing about this old ammunition. He's like, you know what? I've got a couple of those rounds still left over. <laughs> and he brought them in, gave them to me. I was like, yep, that's exactly what those things look like with a little step shoulder. Yep. Where they're, they're um, it's white phosphorus or something like that. Okay. It's, uh, it's when it hits air, it smokes. I've and never seen the smoking ones. That's interesting. It's in the World War II uh, old gun camera footage, especially the Germans, because they used it when they were shooting the V-17s. Okay. And they're sitting behind it. You see all these smoke trails coming off yep. the rounds that are, you know, disappearing into the airplanes. Yep. And uh, that, that's what this stuff is. And, very like I said, cool. it's pretty rare. But you mentioned belt feds. The very first belt fed was the 303s. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got an A4. And that was still in the 70s. And then the movie The Wild Bunch, he, he, that was one of uh, his favorite movies. And in that, they had the 1917 um, Browning water cooled. Mm -hmm. So he acquired one of those. And uh, that sort of started at the uh, collection of belt fed guns, which <laughs> over the years has continued to grow. So moving through from, late, from 78 to 1984, uh, we were he had decided to make a new machine around the 1984 period time frame and that is a machine that's not as expensive to own as the R 1000 was which was his first machine okay gotcha. the, the, the one that was stainless steel that I yep. described to you so he made the RL 300 and then from there the RL 400 and then from there was the RL 4 the RL 500 and then the RL 550 and there was just various modifications that that were significant enough each time to to this designated as a new machine, mm -hmm. each time making it more and more affordable and use, and, uh, and um, really useful to the, to the customer. So did Mike have like an engineering degree? No. Uh, he always called himself a shade tree engineer. Okay. And what that means, um, to, to explain that term, mm -hmm. is that uh, you know you sit under a tree mm -hmm. and uh, in the shade <laughs> thinking about you know, how to fix a problem, how to cure a problem, yep. you know, how something should be, sure. and then you go try it, empirically, yeah. as opposed from, you know, anything that you read somewhere or were trained. Mm -hmm. And and you, you just uh, create something, try it, see how it works, yep. adjust, and, and move forward. But, uh, you know, he's he was not at all an engineer. Interesting. No, not at all. It, it just, you know, he had a, had a mind for it. Yeah, and what what I the way I describe Dillon machines is tried and true, right? When, when there's a Dillon machine, like you mentioned, the 500 and then the 550, mm -hmm. the 550 and then the 550B and then the 550C, you know, it's a still a totally viable, low-cost solution for loading, especially precision mm -hmm. ammo. Yes, because it's a steel platform. Exactly, and, and that, small, that small diameter shell plate doesn't have much flex or, or right. tipping to it. That's right. Uh, Jim Finlay, the guy that was my shooting mentor, he passed a couple years back, he loaded all of his PRS ammo on a 550 with the Dillon thrower. And when he's stacking shots at 600, mm -hmm. it's hard to it's hard to argue with that. Well, thank you. Know? you. Thank you. That, yeah. And I appreciate the endorsement. Well, it's yeah. just it's just the I look up to certain people and, you know, those people have a big impact on you. So, and then so there was the 550 and then what was it? Was it the early to mid 90s for the 650? Okay, so right? then yeah, so now we're into Let's say we're into like 1985, okay? okay. And my dad, um, whose background was aviation, yep. okay, um, starts getting back involved in aviation again. Mm -hmm. And that, that starts to take his interest, okay? Yep. And he's starting with the T-34, this is 1984. Yep. Um, we still have that airplane today. Really? Yep, November 6846 Charlie. Is that the shooting star or is that a No, 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 one? it's a okay. T-34, it's called a Mentor. It's, okay. It's, it's a, uh, it's a piston engine. Okay. It's a small airplane. It's 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 based on the Bonanza. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, anyways, he <laughs> restores that airplane, and then uh, he gets involved in restoring another airplane, a Navy yep. airplane, and um, Xavier Gonzalez mm -hmm. is a is a very important person in, in the Dillon heritage. Okay. okay. The company, and because Xavier started with us in 1982, I believe. Wow. And he was 18 years old. And Xavier's not an engineer either, but he knows how to run a machine, you mm -hmm. know, a, a mill and a lathe. And, mm -hmm. and um, he's like my dad, he can kind of figure things out. But Xavier did a lot of designing his, on his own. Mm -hmm. Around 1984, 1985, they, my dad had been with Xavier just designing new products every day, more mm -hmm. and more new products. Mm -hmm. um, then my dad starts getting involved in aviation. Xavier then makes a machine himself. Oh wow. Pretty much all on his own. 
Um, wow. And that became the XL650. Really? And X stands for Xavier, and okay. we always called him X. And to this day, he's Bit so of trivia X. for you. That's where the X, comes, where the from. X comes from. That's where the X comes from. It's not extra large. Nope. <laughs> okay, yeah, and nice. It's, it's Xavier. And, cool. Uh, and so, let me see. That brings us to late 80s, okay. Mike starts getting involved in the miniguns. He buys miniguns out of Israel. He always wanted to have a minigun. Of course. Okay. Uh, he, I mean, what, what's the genesis of all this? Yeah. He, my dad likes guns. Okay. Yeah. And he likes to shoot. He needs a hobby, huh? He needs, exactly. <laughs> and um, it was perfect for him. And he likes, to, he likes to put guns on airplanes. Yeah. Okay, a great story is before he had um, the belt-fed guns, yep. uh, he had an AT-6. A borrowed AT6, it belonged to a guy named Tom Schroeder. Texan? The Texan. Okay, yep. I got it right this time. <laughs> so he took M1 carbines that are semi automatic mm -hmm. and he bolted them to the bottom of the wings and he put solenoids on them. <laughs> so when he pulls the trigger, a battery just keeps operating these solenoids and just pulling the triggers. <laughs> and he had a lot of uh, 30 carbine tracer. Okay? Wow. And we still have some of that tracer in, to this day. Yep. But so he said, like, well, I got this tracer. I've got these guns. I can arrange it to where it's like I got a machine gun on an airplane, but it actually they're semi-automatic guns. But it, it's like <laughs> so. Anyway, he takes his car out in the Awa Freer River, and he oh, it, it's a dry it's a dry riverbed. Yeah. Okay. Parks the car in the middle. Uh, it's a, it's an old Chevrolet Impala. Okay. And he parks it in the middle of the riverbed, and uh, sets a 16 millimeter camera up on the bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and it's probably I don't know it's. It's probably 80 feet below is mm -hmm. the riverbed, and he uh, he's working with some friends of his. And it, basically, what he wants to do is he wants to break into Hollywood, mm -hmm. and he wants to write stories, <laughs> and he wants to write scripts, and he wants to do filming. So, and he's got friends in, in Hollywood. So he goes and makes this little movie, <laughs> and uh, where he's got his car sitting there, and he flies his T6 down the valley, down the riverbed with the carbines, with the tracers coming off the wings and bouncing up and then the plane pulls off. And I've got this old footage, you know, and one of these days I need to put it on YouTube or something, but it's incredible old footage. And then when he goes back and looks at the footage yep. at our house with the roll up screen, yeah. you know, the, you know and the flickering camera and all the old stuff, you can see that just beyond the car, a bunch of cows. Really? He's like, ah! I never saw those cows. How could I have not seen those cows? I hope I didn't kill a cow. So, anyway, yeah. So the car, he said he was trying to not hit the car because he yep. wanted to drive it back, but he just wanted to have it in the scene, and it wound up getting uh, like around through the radiator, a couple, a couple through the roof, and so let me see. Where does that bring us in our story? That brings us to. That was that was early early seventies. That's before Dylan Precision even existed. Oh really? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, so now moving to before late, the crash, then maybe and all that. That was or? after the crash. After the crash. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so my dad was a was a he got a pilot license, right? And then he became a crop duster because he claimed to have the experience of a crop duster, but he didn't. Then I see where this is going. He got <laughs> yeah, that, that's how he got his first job. Wow. Um, and then he, he said, you know, it was just a matter of just trying to stay alive yeah. long enough to learn how to do this job. Yeah. So I have income and then I have, an, you know, basically I, I have now a job history. I can go get jobs all across Texas, wow. you know, doing this. And then yeah. eventually Arizona. And then from there, he got hired by TWA mm -hmm. as a co-pilot. And that was during the Vietnam War. Okay. Oh, wow. So they had a, a large drawn pilots and, and they needed people and he only had like maybe 200 hours of flying time. Wow. And he, that was an airline pilot, you know? <laughs> and uh, I remember him saying, he said, I really didn't know much about what I was doing. Yeah. He said, but it didn't matter to them. They put yep. me through school. So wow. they taught him, you know, a lot about the instrument flying and so forth. Yep. And he gave him the background that he needed. Uh, he became a firefighter, mm -hmm. uh, flying airplanes, you know, dropping Bore on fires. Mm -hmm. After that, he uh, became a writer for Air Progress Magazine. He was, became, was always very well known for that. Mm -hmm. So growing up as a kid, people would say, your dad's Mike Dillon? Wow, I've read every article he's ever written. And he was an excellent writer. Mm -hmm. And that's part of his success because when he started the Blue Press, the catalog, mm -hmm. he would always write articles cool. in every month. And, and that really it was a, quite an attraction for people. Yeah. Okay, so 
So he became a writer for a Progress magazine, became very well known for that. Mm -hmm. And and then his a friend flew his airplane and crashed it. And, and he was killed in the process. Mm -hmm. And and uh, he had a machine shop and they you know they were close friends. That's when he wound up with a gun and the reloading machines and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And he helped his wife liquidate the machine shop in the estate and, mm -hmm. and she just gave him the gun and said, Look, I just want to give this to you because yeah. Dale would want you to have it. Sure. His name was Dale Grantham. Okay. And then so that's what got him into the reloading, and that takes you to 1972. Mm -hmm. So then, moving forward into 19, late 1980s, mm -hmm. Xavier builds the uh, XL 750, or 650, Yep. and um, my dad starts getting involved in miniguns. He goes to Israel, <laughs> uh, buys, I think, six guns, Whoa. brings them back, and it was just for hobby, and he's like, okay, let's get That's these things. That's an expensive hobby. <laughs> <laughs> it is an expensive hobby, but, but he had a business that could afford it. Sure. I mean, you know, he could afford it. Um, it was really in line with what he liked to do. Mm -hmm. And um, it, so he's got these guns. Uh, and see, the thing about my dad is that anything he would do, he always figured out a way to make a profit out of it. So he'd bring, say, for example, six guns in. Mm -hmm. He would clean them up, and he would turn around and sell them for more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's kind of how you know, the everything works, right? Well, when you so can take your him, passions and you can take fun and you can turn that into a livelihood. It's amazing. And it's, that's what he was so good at. He could always connect the dots. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. So he bought these guns and they were not in working condition for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Like, you know, that something was wrong with them. Whatever. Sure. Yep. And, uh, and that's partly why they, they liquidated all their guns, Israel mm -hmm. did, at mm -hmm. least in this um, one uh, Group of people that he was talking to. Gotcha. He said, "Look, we got six left. You can take all. Of them. Yep. But you got to take them all. Gotcha. And all the spares, just get them out of here. Um, and uh, so he found. So he starts working with these guns. He's like, oh, this is. This could be so much better. Mm -hmm. There's so much. You know, if, if I were to build this gun today, I wouldn't do it this way. I would do it another way. Right. And so he's like, hey, I got an idea. And he starts modifying. It. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, this thing right here makes such a difference. And he's talking to the military. The military is like, well, to a large extent, we're not even using those guns anymore mm -hmm. because they break. You know, we don't have anyone to fix them. No mm -hmm. one really knows how to work on them. And he's like, well, I see an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start making parts for them. I'm going to, uh, you know, and, he, and then he would actually go and meet with guys, military uh, personnel, mm -hmm. um, and not like in a military environment, mm -hmm. but like in their, I don't know, off-duty civilian clothes, whatever, but mm -hmm. at the range working on whatever projects they were working with, mm -hmm. and we had the ability to go see them. You know, and I'd just tag along on a few occasions, <laughs> but it's not like we were in a place where there would need to be security clearance. It was just yep. like, hey, we'll just meet here, we're out doing some stuff, and bring your stuff along, we'll take a look mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. And so he was meeting people like that, and then they were like, oh yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, I'll, I'll arrange for you to send some stuff out mm -hmm. to uh, these group of people and they'll, they'll take a look at it and, yep. and let us know what they think. And, and, and it stepped through like that. Hmm. They liked it. And then he started servicing these groups of people, um, in the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually small groups, not, it wasn't something like a large congressional thing where, <laughs> where you know, there's a big review and sure. POs are issued. It's just more like, well, meet us here at this time and we'll just see what you got. You Interesting. Know? And so, um, that turned out really good, and then from there, just like he did with the reloading machines, he just mm -hmm. kept, I can do this, wait, I, you know, let's fix this, and we mm -hmm. can make this part better, and just kept going all the way through the gun, and building an entire gun, and selling entire systems, and feed systems, and so forth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's how it was. So it just started out with precision. Precision gave him the foundation to, uh, to, to get back into aviation, something that mm -hmm. he really loved, and then from there, he, had, he uh, started to think more about miniguns because mm -hmm. he met someone who had one yeah. and it saw it fire and he's like, I've got to have Amazing. one. Amazing. So then, <laughs> yeah, he got the miniguns and then it was it was just uh, the same thing he had always done his whole life. He just he just repeated that again. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, it, it helps me understand where like the 1050 came from. If you've got a minigun and mm -hmm. you need bulk ammo and you need bulk ammo done right, yep. You know, it's got to be, you're thinking on an industrial scale, right. industrial equipment, because yep. homeowner stuff is not going to cut it, you know, in that right. context. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yep. You need um, professional grade. Right. Yeah. 
And now we've got a new wave of equipment that is essentially a slight evolution on some of these presses, mm -hmm. right? The 1100 right. just came out, we've got the 750, changes mm -hmm. the priming system and a couple other tweaks, but really the DNA is all of the same. The DNA is, yep. Yeah, yep. so here you are, your dad passed a couple years back, mm -hmm. very sorry to hear about that. How does your philosophy differ and, and how do you think about bringing this legacy forward for the next generations to come? Oh, well, what we wanted, okay, so, we do catalogs. Mm -hmm. uh, let me know if I'm answering the question you asked. Sure. Okay, so we do catalogs every month, right? Yep. And you've seen so many things change mm -hmm. in terms of social media and, and, and how you know marketing is done and people are communicating sure. these days. People buy products and evaluate products in different ways nowadays. I exactly. It's totally evolved. Yeah. So, like my kids, they don't even watch television. We were looking at doing commercials, and mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, and, and it's like I'm not so sure that we're reaching the younger. Sure. You know, people out there. So um, we, we started a social media department, mm -hmm. you know, trying to learn how to do that and bringing people in that, yeah. that are good at that, younger people. Yep. So, you know, in terms of how do we want to continue this company going mm -hmm. forward, social media, I think, is an important part of it. I could see mail starting to drop off, so mm -hmm. we can't be as rely, relying on the catalogs yeah. as we have in the past. I mean, an electronic version of the catalog, but mm -hmm. not the one that goes in the mail. Beyond that, um, you know, I've got four kids. Uh, I've got a brother. I've got a sister. They've mm -hmm. got kids, and um, and they're all interested in the business, and we all work together. And so, you know, that's great. When it works so, out that way, that's pretty rare. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to showing all of the new equipment mm -hmm. and really just demonstrating what the new capabilities are. Thank you. Loading a bunch Fantastic. of great ammo. I got a whole bunch of high volume shooting stories that I'm going to work with. Subsonic, 300 blackout suppressed, you know, a lot of pistol action shooting and stuff like that. Bullet feeders, just putting it all together and having okay. a lot of fun with it. Terrific. So, yeah. Thank you, awesome. Steve. Thank you I really much. appreciate the time. Uh -huh. And what, yes. what's really special about this to me is that not a lot of people get to hear this kind of history. Right. And some of these stories, because it sounds to me like Mike Dillon would have been the kind of guy I would have liked oh, yeah. hanging awesome. out with. I yeah. mean, a ton of fun. And I try and I, I try and live that spirit too of not not growing old, seeing an adventure and jumping on it, and hopefully that inspires you all as well. So, uh, if you like, please uh, drop a comment. Let us know what you think about Dylan Products, and make sure you're subscribed with notifications because I got a lot more Shot Show 2020 content, a lot more blue content coming up. Till next time, happy shooting and happy reloading. <laughs>